In the previous video, I showed how to calculate line integrals by doing a single variable integral where the variable of integration was the curve parameter. The new kind of integral, a line integral, was reduced to a single variable integral which I already stood from, understood from single variable calculus. This mirrors an approach from earlier sections of the course. For integration over two, three, and higher dimensional regions, the method of calculation was iterated integrals, which again reduced the problem to a series of understood single variable integrals. Reduction to single variable integrals is an excellent strategy. It means that I don't have to invent entirely new techniques and methods for multiple integrals. I can instead rely on all the previous knowledge I already have for an integral. It is also very typical for mathematics. Many, many mathematical problems are quote unquote solved by simply reducing them to another type of problem that is already considered solved. However, as good as these reductions were, they miss something important. To understand what they are missing, let me return to the fundamental theorem of calculus. To remind you of one of the formulations of the fundamental theorem, let f be a differentiable function. The fundamental theorem says that integrating a derivative is the same as evaluating the original function on the endpoints of the interval. Let me rephrase that slightly, evaluating on the boundary of the interval. I haven't really talked about fundamental theorems in this course, but that's about to change. The core idea of the fundamental theorem will now return in full force. And to get there, let me look again at what the fundamental theorem does. I want to make an archetype out of the fundamental theorem. To that end, I'm going to boil down the idea to this basic one. The fundamental theorem relates integrals where there is a derivative on the right and a boundary on the left. In this context, I can ask for other similar results. What theorems relate integrals where there is some kind of differential operator on the left and some kind of set boundary on the right? In symbols, if nabla is some differential operator and um, this del symbol is the boundary of some set, I'm looking for theorems that fit this archetype. It turns out there are many such theorems. A major part of the rest of this course will be understanding these theorems. What kind of differential operators can show up on the left side and for what kinds of integrals? What kinds of sets and boundaries match with the differential operators on the right? And I can start answering this question already with line integrals. The first new fundamental theorem is about line integrals. So let F capital F be a conservative vector field so that lowercase f is its potential. Let gamma be a curve in the domain of capital F. The fundamental theorem says this, the integral of a conservative vector field is equal to the potential evaluated at the end of the curve minus the potential evaluated at the start of the curve. Compare this to the original fundamental theorem. On the left, there is a derivative, the basic derivative for the original and the gradient for the line integral. On the right, the derivative is gone. The original f remains, and it is evaluated at the end of the integral of the curve minus the start. It's the same pattern, the same setup. The fundamental theorem of line integrals gives a really nice way to calculate line integrals of conservative fields. Calculate a potential and evaluate the endpoints. However, it does quite a bit more conceptually. It gets to the heart of what is going on with conservative vector fields. Here is a definition. A line integral which only depends on the endpoints of the curve is called path independent. This means that any path between the two points gives the same result for the integral. The path doesn't matter, only the start and the end. To do the line integral of a conservative vector field is just to evaluate at the endpoints. Nothing about the curve in between matters. Any path between the endpoints will have the same right-hand side. So, line integrals of conservative vector fields are path independent. What does this mean? Well, let me think about forces and potential energy again. If lowercase f is potential energy, then this right side, f of gamma of b minus f of gamma of a, is the potential energy at the end minus the potential energy at the start. This difference is the change in potential energy. 
the work to move through the force field is equal to the change in potential energy. Only the change in potential energy from the start to the end. And this is getting at the conservative idea, only the change in energy matters. Where, though, does the energy go? You might remember from physics that lost potential energy should become kinetic energy or vice versa. Well, let me show you. Again, let F be a conservative force. The line integral is the change in potential energy, negative because of the energy conven conventions. Force causes potential energy to decrease, not increase. Newton's first law is F equals ma, where a is acceleration, so I can replace F with ma. Also, if a curve is representing motion, then the second derivative of that curve is acceleration, so let me replace, make that replacement as well. Now I have a very clever use of the Leibniz rule for the dot product. This derivative is the derivative of gamma prime dot with itself, but that produces two copies in the product rule, so I need to divide by two. Then the dot product of gamma with itself is length squared, so I move the one half out of the integral and write this as length squared. Then this is the integral of a derivative in a normal single variable way, so I remove these two and evaluate at the endpoints. The length of the tangent of the curve is scalar velocity. What I get out of this evaluation is m times the final velocity squared over 2 minus m times the initial velocity squared over 2. These are kinetic energy terms, and this is the change in kinetic energy. The result of the calculation is that the loss in potential energy is exactly the gain in kinetic energy. And this can finally explain the conservative field name. These fields conserve energy. This conversation, conservation of energy setup used to be something very specific to gravity and electromagnetic forces, but now any conservative vector field works this way. For any conservative field, the line integrals are given by the changes in the potential, and I can calculate that the negative of the potential change will always be a kinetic energy change. Energy is conserved because of the fundamental theorem of line integrals, because of path independence, because the fourth force comes from a potential as a gradient. Let me finish with some finer details of these properties of conservative vector fields. Conservative vector fields are path independent, but is the converse true? Well, like with gradients and curls, I need a condition. If a field is path independent on a path connected open set, that topology definition I did earlier this week, then it is conservative. So, so conservative and path independence are almost exactly equivalent. They are equivalent as long as the domain is a single piece, a path connected set. So let me recap. Assume that I'm working over a path connected and simply connected set. Then the following statements are all equivalent. F is conservative. That is by definition, it is the gradient of a potential. That means that all integrals of F are path independent, only the start and the end. end. The change in energy matters. And this is equivalent to the line integral of F being zero over any closed path. If the start and the end is the same, then the potential energy is the same, and no net effect has been accomplished. And finally, this is equivalent to the field being irrotational. On this path-connected, simply-connected set, I can use the curl to check if the field is conservative.